Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Dave Brown. I'm the CEO of Valley Leadership and uh, appreciate you taking your lunch hour possibly to talk about an important proposition mm -hmm. that's on your ballot, which are getting mailed out today for those doing early voting. Um, an exciting, um, overwhelming, and possibly confusing ballot uh, is headed out to Arizonans across the state. So we're, we're going to highlight two here for you today and this afternoon um, that we hope can be uh, help you when you make your decisions. So um, we just do a quick intro here, or not intro, but let you know who's going to be talking to you today. We're joined by Jane Anderson, who is our impact team lead, uh, Dr. Tom Riley from ASU, and then Marcus Del Artino, a longtime political strategist here in Arizona, to talk through these two, uh, again, very important and um, conflicting ballot propositions uh, that relate to how we vote. So super important. Uh, just a quick backgrounder on the impact teams and impact maker, which you see the blue signs here, blue backgrounds for Amanda, Jane, and I. Uh, our impact teams are working on the most pressing issues facing Arizona, and they're doing it in a pursuit of immediate change, but then also systemic change. So we have all the teams you see listed here our most recently launched team is the civic engagement team. And uh, when you think about systemic change, in particular with these two uh, ballot propositions that are up this year, uh, a big systemic change to the way Arizonans can vote in the primary. So we know that there are lots of ballot propositions out there on the ballot this year. We wanted to highlight these two because of that uh, underlying foundational um, mantra of our impact maker work, which is uh, we want to see systemic change, and that's what these two um, are intended to do. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jane Anderson, our fearless leader, uh, volunteer, and VL alum who manages our civic in engagement team. Jane? Thanks, Dave. Welcome, everyone. Um, it is election time. I don't know if you're aware of that. I don't know if you've gotten a few texts or if you've watched TV at all. Um, but Arizona obviously is a hot spot and a focus for the nation at this time. Uh, a few months ago, uh, well, probably about six months ago, uh, it was brought up that perhaps it might be wise to have an impact team that focuses on civic engagement. Valley leadership is not, doesn't just jump into projects willy nilly. Um, but as the discussion was had about what are some things that are really important in Arizona, we decided that this was an area that needed to have uh, a light shown on it and, and an opportunity for us to really make a difference. Valley leadership is action driven. And so we want to share quickly what our vision, long term goals, and to do items are. Again, if you're not familiar with Valley leadership, we use the phrase driven to do. We don't just talk about what we want to get done, we really want to enact change. So the vision for our impact team is that all Arizonans are informed, able, and empowered to actively engage in our democracy at all levels. Um, our long-term goals, and with all Valley Leadership Impact Teams, long-term goals will be something that is measurable. Now, we have two areas we're working on. One is, would be kind of termed formal democracy. So if you look at that to-do item number one, it's to increase the number of Arizonans who are informed and equipped to engage with public policy decision-making and elections. That's gonna be measured in large part by the long-term goal number one. It ladders up to that number one there, voter turnout increases as a set percentage. So that is what we think of as typically what we're doing here today. We're learning a little bit more about what's gonna be on the ballot. We're trying to increase education amongst Arizonans and help them feel empowered to make the choice that they feel is best for them. Um, the other area that we're gonna be working on, if you look at to do item number two, is kind of that small D democracy. We're looking at bringing Arizonans together to dialogue across potential lines of difference. Um, now, our, if you ladder up to that number two long-term goal, we're not quite sure how we're going to measure that yet, but we're not going to let that stop us from, from starting that work. So if you are interested in any of these things, if this is something that piques your interest, please reach out. We would love to get you involved as we um, launch the Civic Engagement Impact Team. And we have a great set of team members. You might see some names you recognize. They are across the spectrum from people that are kind of in the political field already, 
to people who are in media, to people in private business. So we really have a wide range of people involved, um, also education. So we really love that we have this, this cross section of Arizonans that are really um, wanting to make sure that civic engagement is at the forefront. With that, you don't wanna to listen to me today. You wanna to listen to some experts. So we're excited to have Dr. Tom Riley here. He's a professor in the School of Public Affairs for Arizona State University, and he's co-director for the Center for an Independent and Sustainable Democracy. He's gonna walk us through some of the nuts and bolts of these two propositions, help us to understand, you know, how do propositions get on the ballot? Who got these different propositions on? How do they differ? And then we have Marcus Delartino, who's a partner at First Strategic Communication and Public Affairs, um, who will give us a, maybe a little bit more color. Who are the groups that are kind of maybe for or against different ones? What are some other angles that we might want to think about? So I'll go, go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Tom Riley. All right. Well, thank you for having me, Jane. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, screen share. Wonderful. Okay, so I'll briefly just go over... Um, just propositions in general. Uh, then we'll break down the seven components of Proposition 140 uh, um, and then discuss 133 briefly. And then the last couple slides are just where are open primaries nationally and where are the eight campaigns that are currently happening right now. If I go too quick over some of these slides, uh, Jane said should make the PowerPoint available for everybody so uh, you can look at it in more detail. Um, you know, obviously, in the roots of Arizona's system, our forefathers uh, embraced the notion of direct democracy. It wasn't to replace representative democracy, but they felt that a truly functional democracy needed a check and balance. And so they uh, put in our Constitution kind of the three major forms of direct democracy that exist in the United States, the recall, the referendum, uh, and the initiative. Um, the, okay, the voter referendum provides a, a mechanism for uh, challenging legislative action. And then the last one is the voter initiative, which provides the public with a mechanism to get around the legislature who refuse to take action that's desired by the majority of voters. In Arizona, uh, we uh, allow both the legislature as well as voters uh, to put uh, initiatives on, the citizens initiative, which is Prop 140, and legislative referrals which would be Prop 133, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, just very quick on the signature thresholds, um, if we uh, go down to the Citizens Initiative, in order to change a state statute, it's 10% of the most recent gubernatorial election. And for constitutional amendments, it's 15%. The magic number this year is a bit over 383,000 legitimate signatures. This is just interesting, I won't go over in details, but just kind of looks at legislatively referred and citizens initiative since the beginning in 1911, just the pass rate. I think what's very interesting is that legislative referred initiatives have a higher pass rate than citizens initiative, which was a bit surprising to me when I pulled this together. This is just a summary again from 1911 to 2022 on the pass rates. Okay, so initiatives are propositions that are proposed by citizens. And this year we have two, 139, and we'll be focusing on 140. These proposals represent months and sometimes years of work as groups of citizens must write and file the proposed language, then gather hundreds of thousands of signatures to ensure that the proposition appears in the ballot. Uh, referrals are propositions that are referred to the ballot by the legislature. The legislature can pass changes to state law during the regular legislative session only. However, securing approval by a majority of the legislators allows the referrals to appear on the ballot without the governor's signature, which is a key point, thus really bypassing potential vetoes. Notably, any referral proposing changes to the Arizona Constitution must attain voter approval. This year, we have six uh, legislative uh, referrals that change the constitution and five that are changing uh, the state statute. We'll be focusing on 133. Okay, so Prop 140, a make elections fair, basically replaces the current primary system where voters can only vote within one party to a system where all eligible candidates 
are listed on the same primary ballot. It prohibits the use of taxpayers' funds for partisan elections and requires the same signature requirements for all candidates running for office. And there are basically seven main changes uh, that this proposition would put into place if passed. And if the pro pro proposition is approved by voters, these changes would become effective July 1st, 2026. It's worth noting right now, most of you probably know this, but currently uh, those that are registered uh, as unaffiliated or not part of the parties can um, <clears throat> participate in primary elections by requesting a ballot, either a Republican or Democrat ballot. Uh, for many people, that's pretty confusing. I think that plays out when we look at those uh, people who are, on, are unaffiliated who participate in primary elections. There is one uh, exception to that in Arizona. Uh, that's with presidential preference. And those were uh, independents or those that are unaffiliated cannot participate uh, in the primary system. So the first area is primary election procedures. So this makes it so that all candidates who qualify for a ballot are placed on the same ballot, regardless of political party. It allows any qualified voter to vote in the primary election, again, regardless of party. And third, it allows all candidates for the same office to have the same signature requirements to qualify for the ballot, regardless of party. Currently, independent candidates must collect more signatures, about six times the rate uh, of partisan candidates. The second component talks about the number of candidates who can advance from the primary election. So the primary election, everybody appears without regard to party. Uh, and this is uh, 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 an overview of basically how many can advance from the primary to the general in this proposition. If there's one seat that is open, there can be between two and five candidates that can advance to the general election. If there are two seats open, like our House, Corporate Commission, there can be between four and seven candidates can advance to the general election. And for a race where there's three open seats, between six and eight candidates may advance to the general election. A candidate's party cannot be considered when determining who advances from the primary to the general election. It also allows the legislature to change the number of candidates allowed to advance to the general election once every six years, or they can go through a future initiative or referendum to unpin what was passed. Now it's important, which is a little tricky here, but this provision regarding determining how many candidates can advance from the primary to the general apply to the federal, state, and county elections. They do not apply to city elections. However, if this passes, uh, cities such as Tucson that currently has partisan elections or any charter city would need to end their partisan primaries. So they would be required to have open primaries, but they would not be subject to what the legislature decides on how many individuals can advance from the primary to the general. If two candidates advance to the general election for a single office, the candidate then receives the majority of votes is elected. So if the legislature decides there's only two, then the majority person wins. If three or more candidates advance to the general election for a single office, voter rankings or rank choice voting will be used to determine which candidate is elected. An important component of this proposition is it specifies that the if the legislature does not enact laws to codify the new primary election processes by November 2025, the Secretary of State may do so. And as long as the process allows voters to rank candidates for office in order of preference. And so this is important is that the legislature, along with the approval of the governor, has to come up with how this will be implemented. The proposition mandates open primaries, but it really kind of punts to the legislature to talk about how that's implemented. And anywhere for a single office from two to five can advance. If the top two advance, then the majority wins. If it's more than two, they are required to do voter ranking or ranked choice voting. 
Now, ranked choice voting is what the proposition does. It allows voter rankings or ranked choice voting to be used to determine winning candidates in a general election if more than two candidates advance. If more than two, to, two candidates advance in a single winner's race, such as state, senate, governor, AG, they must use voter ranking. It's required. But if there is more than one seat to fill, like the state of Repre House of Representatives, corporate commission, voter rankings are not required, regardless of how many the legislature decides will advance to the general election. So the key here for single uh, uh, seats, when there's more than two, rank choice voting is required. If there are uh, multiple uh, seat elections, then voter ranking or rank choice voting is not required. Of the use of money, uh, public monies. This specifies that public funds shall not be used to run political party elections, including precinct committee uh, officers, presidential preference elections, and partisan primary elections. However, there is an exception to this. An exception would allow public funds to be used to run a presidential preference election if voters who are registered as independent or non-party affiliated or a party not on the ballot may vote in the election of any of the political parties that are not qualified for the ballot. So the use of public monies is interesting is that, you know, as a country, we began using public monies for primaries during the progressive era. It was one of those major reforms. And the thought at the time was that they wanted the parties to be more transparent. So to do so, they funded it. Well, we'll fast forward now to 2024, and in states like Arizona, where independents are unaffiliated, you know, or equal to Republicans or slightly above Republicans in voter registration. And there's concerns about if we're using public monies, can you exclude people from voting? As I mentioned before, is that Currently, right now, we're a semi-open state where we do allow people who are unaffiliated to participate in partisan primaries um, as long as they request a ballot, a Republican or Democrat ballot. But that does not pertain to presidential preference elections where independents or unaffiliated are prohibited from participating in presidential preference elections. Um, this, if Prop 140 passes, this would allow funding to continue, but it would kind of revert back to how we currently handle primary elections where those that are independent or party not designated can request a ballot for the Republican or Democrat. If they refuse that, then there can be no public funds that are used. And then the last two areas, the proposition further specifies that a person cannot be denied the right to vote or hold office based on political party affiliation or non-affiliation. And the last part is a person cannot be restricted from receiving a ballot or selecting a candidate based on political party affiliation or non-affiliation. Now, Prop 133, which is primary elections and eligible candidates, this basically requires partisan primary elections for partisan offices. And it per permits the legislature to supersede charter city laws governing their primary elections. So basically what this does, it's silent on the issue of ranked choice voting. It just basically codifies that you're required to do and have partisan elections. Uh, so again, it doesn't address ranked choice voting, so it maintains the status quo on that issue. But it does permit the legislature to supersede charter city laws governing their primary elections. The um, How open primaries are occurring right now nationally, this is just a breakdown as far as those that have actually adopted open primaries top two or ranked choice voting. So currently right now, those that are top two, well, this is, there's no party primary, everybody votes, and then the top two proceed to the general. This is occurring in California, Nebraska, and Washington. Of course, there are uh, uh, exceptions as would be Prop 140, 
For example, in California, this excludes those presidential preference elections, uh, and it excludes local offices, um, similar to Prop 140, where it excludes uh, uh, cities. There's one state that has top four, so the top four candidates would proceed from a primary, and then ranked choice voting is um, implemented. And here is that no party primary, uh, every voter gets to vote, and then the top four go to the general election, and then ranked choice voting is implemented. If one candidate receives 50%, then that person is declared a winner. If not, uh, citizens would rank the top four candidates, and the candidate number four with the lowest number of votes would have his or her votes reallocate it to the top three. If that doesn't produce a winner with over 50%, then you would go to the third candidate and his or her vote would be reallocated to the top two, where then they would declare a winner with over 50%. But again, that ranked choice voting would not put, be put in place unless there's over, um, a, one candidate doesn't receive 50.1% of the vote. Then there's a, and Maine has something where they do have a party primary, but then they do rank choice voting uh, in the general if no candidate receives 50%. And the last state is Louisiana has no primary, everybody votes, uh, but if no one receives 50%, then they go to a, a runoff. They don't employ any type of voter ranking. And then this is my last slide, so hopefully we have time for questions. Um, so there, there are actually eight campaigns that are appearing on ballots across the United States in 2024. One would actually repeal, and then seven would actually introduce a combination of top two open primaries and ranked choice voting. In Alaska, uh, there's a uh, an initiative that would actually repeal their current top four, which I just went over. Uh, that they've currently implemented that. There is uh, an initiative and a vote to actually repeal uh, their open primary top four and ranked choice voting. Uh, as we mentioned, and we went over in Arizona, we would require nonpartisan primaries. Here, the legislature decides its implementation with some caveats, right? Uh, the caveat being if there are more than two and they don't go with the top two, then they have to use ranked choice voting in the general. Colorado has an initiative that is an open primary and would refer the top four from the primary and would require ranked choice voting in the general if no one receives 50%. That is a similar proposal that Idaho uh, is, uh, citizens are, are considering, which would be the top four primary and then ranked choice voting. Montana actually has two separate measures. One is an open primary, top four primary. Um, and then the other is a majority winner. And that would either be through ranked choice voting or a runoff. And again, that would punt to the legislature and the legislature would decide whether they would have another election for a runoff or whether they would um, uh, implement a ranked voting or ranked choice voting. Uh, Nevada uh, has a top five primary, similar to the top four, but five, and would mandate ranked choice voting. Nevada is a little interesting because this is the second time that it appears on the ballot. In Nevada, unlike other states like Arizona, that we require a simple majority to change the Constitution, they require two sessions of the legislature and a vote of the people, and they meet every two years. So the process takes around five years in order to change their Constitution. Uh, in 2022, it passed uh, the top five primary, the ranked choice voting. Now it is appearing on the ballot for a second time, which is required by Nevada law. South Dakota uh, basically has a top two primary. No ranked choice voting because the top two, like California, would proceed to the general regardless of party. And then the last one is Washington, D.C., which would have open partisan primaries, and then independents here can choose a D or an R ballot current to what we have 
our current process in Arizona. And then in the general election, if no one received 50%, there would be ranked choice voting. Sorry, I blew through that so quickly, but hopefully um, after there's firmer, further commentary, I can answer any questions or uh, address any of the slides in more detail. That was such a great overview, Professor Riley. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about all of this in context. Um, and if you want to stop sharing the screen there, that would be great. Yep. Um, it's really good to think about all of this in context, who are bringing these different items to the ballot, um, and then what are the consequences um, if they pass. One thing um, just to note as well, because we have a rare instance where um, both of these items could pass, um, do you want to just real quickly before we move on, tell a little bit about what happens if they both receive 50% plus one? Jane, very good question. Um, so if, if um, basically, if there's two ballot initiatives that are in opposition to each other uh, and both passes, the one with the most votes prevail. Now, there is a new provision that we have in Arizona that if there are two ballot measures and they're similar in nation, there's a commission that can combine them. This is not the case with 140 and 133. As you pointed out, Jane, from the beginning, they're kind of, you know, opposed, diametrically opposed. Uh, to each other. Yeah. And both change the constitution. So I think that's really important to know. Right. Exactly. So one through the legislative process and the other is either one of this, there's 11, you know, uh, uh, legislative referred, and it, which is kind of, you know, we have so many because we have a divided government, governor vetoed a lot. This is one way legislators, the majority party in power can get around legislative veto. That's why we have 11. And of course, six of those are constitutional changes and five are statute changes. Great. Thank you so much. We're going to kick it over to Marcus Del Artino, who's going to add a little bit of insight on this. So who are some of the groups that have come out for or against these different initiatives? What are some of the arguments? We've heard kind of here's the nuts and bolts. Here's the facts of it. Get, add a little bit of context to it. Sure. First of all, uh, Jane, thanks for having me. And ordinarily, you'd catch me in a suit and tie for this. And I apologize for that. But I happen to be you've caught me on uh, fall break with the kids. Um, so I'm a little bit more casual than I'm used to. Um, and I, I generally like to start out these conversations with just reminding everybody that years ago, Arizona passed uh, the uh, an act, which makes it very, very difficult to change these measures if voters approve them. Um, and so there is a mechanism to do it. It's now at the state legislature. It takes a super majority, which uh, is extremely difficult to achieve and, and can only further the cause of the measure. So uh, what I warn everybody is make sure you're very comfortable uh, with these measures when you vote on them, not only now, but envision what, what life might be like in 10 years and how that might affect public policy. So with that being said, um, you know, early on, there was certainly uh, rumors, if you will, that 140 may be coming on the ballot, that they were organizing, that they were raising money, um, and that they were out getting signatures to put a proposal on the ballot. Um, and so the Republican-controlled legislature in both the House and the Senate um, you know, came forward with their own idea, and it was largely perpetrated between, uh, you know, the Republican Party, but more importantly, really, Turning Point, uh, Charlie Kirk's organization, which uh, has become the functional arm, if you will, of the Republican Party. And the concept behind uh, uh, the first measure, the one, and I apologize, is 130 or 133, I can't keep them all straight. Um, anyway, the, the purpose of that measure is to enshrine the current practice. So you will see no change. If, if that measure is to pass um, and the Make, Make Elections Fair Act is to fail, uh, you will see virtually almost no difference in your daily life. It's This enshrines the current primary system uh, into, uh, into the constitution. So, uh, and by the way, it'll make it very hard to change that in the future. But you have to say you you are comfortable with the current system. Republicans vote for Republicans. Democrats vote for Democrats. Independents can uh, participate in the primary, but it is it is a hard burden. Do they have to go to the, the the county recorder and request a ballot from from one of the parties? Make a choice there. 
So that's step one. Step two was obviously uh, make elections fair, uh, was able through uh, a long and arduous process to get approved on the ballot and, and really just recently cleared uh, the last test at the Supreme Court uh, uh, within the last two weeks um, and had multiple challenges over the system. Uh, the first part of that for voters to understand is very easy to understand, and that is everybody gets the same ballot. Okay, so um, and we won't, if you're a Republican, the same names are going to appear on my ballot as appear on uh, a Democrat's ballot, that appear on an independence ballot, that appear on a Libertarian's ballot or a Green Party ballot. All the names are the same. Okay, that's the open primary. That's that's relatively easy to understand uh, for most for most voters. Where it gets a little bit more complicated, uh, as Tom so aptly pointed out, is this this legislative part uh, for the general election, which goes into ranked choice voting. However, I will tell you that what's written in the law is m most often not sort of how this is going to occur. So. What it says is the legislature is going to have to come up with the rules for the general election. And if, which is more likely probably than not, although if the Republicans are to maintain a Republican majority in the House and the Senate, which is questionable in the Senate for sure, um, there is absolutely no way they are going to allow for a ranked choice voting. Uh, and they're up against sort of this, this barrier, the security that if, if you don't come up with the solution, then the Secretary of State will come up with the rules. And the Secretary of State, of course, is a Democrat, Adrian Fontes, very nice person. Uh, but they are never going to allow Adrian Fontes to make up these rules. And so what's the most practical um, and thought out sort of answer that the legislature would be coming up with is a top two. Um, and would be very somewhat similar uh, to what you uh, experience now on your ballot. Um, but that would be probably their, their only or probably best solution from their viewpoint uh, on how to deal with that, with that ranked choice voting uh, component. Um, so it wouldn't be as complicated as I think um, the, the, the initiative sort of writes out um, it would be far it would be far more sort of upfront. Um, as far as groups that have come out in favor and opposed, um, you know, obviously, sort of the Republican Party, the more conservative unit uh, wing, uh, the turning points, obviously, do not favor make elections fair. The the one forty they like their legislative referral that they put forward, um, and and so uh, and we've heard, you know, certainly the the governor's office now not the democratic party but the governor's office has been against 140 and i think that there's some theory that that would have an impact on her re-election campaign and hence the reason the opposition um but groups that favor it are you know the centrist organizations the legal women voters uh type of operations uh that want to see a change uh in how we elect our local leaders um, and so uh, hopefully you've got a few questions I can, I can go to, but uh, what I urge everybody to do is make sure you read these um, and go through them and put some, put some thought into it. Um, you, you have the ability to vote at home. You've got plenty of time. Um, you know, you can do it after dinner and talk to your spouse around the dinner table and bounce questions off each other. Do not wait till the last minute. Um, you know, obviously lines are going to be packed on, on election day. Save yourself the headache, vote early, um, and, uh, you know, do everybody a favor and, and just do it around your kitchen table and stick it in the mail. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you both so much. I actually have a, before we kick it out for general questions, I have one question um, for Professor Riley and then one for you, Marcus. Um, the first one, can you give some context under our current system? Um, what percentage approximately of independents do vote in partisan primaries and what percentage of our electorate are independents? That's a good question. So um, right now, if we look at uh, statewide numbers, um, the latest numbers from Secretary of State's office has Republicans and, Dem has Republicans and non, 
party affiliated about the same. So we have about 35.4% um, people are registered as Republicans. Um, those that are not designated a party are thir about 34%. If you add the small parties together, 1.5, it's exactly the same number, a little higher than the Republicans. Democrats are about 90, uh, 29%. So what you see is Republicans and independents, and, and independents have historically increased uh, over the years. So definitely uh, uh, Arizona is becoming more independent. Very interesting. We just did a study of... Um, uh, Gen Z voters, Arizona Gen Z voters, and and just shy of fifty percent of those under the age of thirty are independent. Yeah, it's 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 startling uh, about the number of individuals that are independent. Maricopa County, those numbers are are just pretty much a mirror of what it is statewide. Um, it, it, I'd have to double check on it. You know, I a bit ago I ran it in twenty twenty two. Basically, that independents underperform in the primary and they overperform in the um in the general election um i believe it was you know they're about 33 percent in 2022 i think they're between 20 they're about 25 percent if i'm not mistaken of those that actually voted uh but they overperformed you know according to edison polling in the 2022 election they were almost 40 percent uh so yeah i think it kind of underscores the issue is that Although the Secretary of State's try to put that out there, that if you're party unaffiliated, you can participate in primaries that are not presidential. It is a bit confusing because, you know, what does it mean to pull a ballot, you know, or to request a ballot? But, you know, you can do that by mail, or if you vote in person, you can actually request a Republican or Democratic uh, ballot in the primary. Thanks so much. I think that's important to look at. I, I hadn't heard that statistic about younger voters, but that that's very interesting and surprising, but definitely interesting. And then Marcus, a question for you. If um, the House or the Senate were to change hands, um, what is the feeling that you get from Democrats? Would it be very similar that they would also prefer to keep it top two or what would, what are, what's some insights there? It's really interesting actually, Jane. So thanks. Cause I was just thinking I needed to clear that up. Uh, you know, certainly the, the governor's expressed her displeasure, shall we say, with 140. However, um, that being said, that is not the case with the Secretary of State uh, or the AG um, or a lot more of the lockstep sort of Democratic Party. Um, what's interesting to me is I think the, the further progressive that you go within the Democratic Party, the more that you, you are attracted to the right choice voting. Um, that being said, if one body is in Republican majority and then other bodies in Democratic majority, we're going to have to see compromise if 140 is to pass one way or the other. I don't, I'm not too sure how, this legislature has not been known <laughs> in the last few years for compromise. So it would certainly be uh, an interesting event to say the very least. Um, and we'd have to see how that uh, sort of works out. But um, I think that the, the easiest solution for all of them is the top two. Most voters really understand this open primary, this first concept where I start to see uh, the voters lose a little bit and really have to go through an explanation process is the second part when you get into the ranked choice voting. And I think, you know, for Republicans, they have this sort of flashback, if you will, to Sarah Palin uh, in Alaska. Um, and Tom, Tom alluded to that a little bit, but so, in, in that case, uh, open house seat, um, the former member had passed away and there was Sarah Palin was running. Um, and then you had a candidate named P Peltola, uh, who was a Democrat. Then you got Palin and then you got Begich, which is a really Republican conservative, just as much as, as Palin, if not more. Um, and they go into that primary uh, the Democrat wins 39.7 on the first round. Palin wins 30.9%. And then the other Republican, this Begich, wins 27.8%. Um, and so when it gets all recalculated and you take Begich's vote drops off um, and they recalculate it, then the Democrat wins. And the, and the argument to that is the majority of Republicans actually voted for Republican policies but a Democrat won. And so that, that is sort of what is rolling in the back of, of 
Republicans' heads for for some perspective. If I can add to that, because I think Mark is, is right, is that, is that Alaska seems to be the pivotal point. A year ago, we did a, a pretty large sample of registered voters and wide support for open primaries among Republicans, Democrats, and independents, over 80%. But ranked choice voting was definitely a partisan issue, right, uh, particularly with Republicans. And it was you know little, barely at 50%. So you know a lot of support for the open primaries, less for ranked choice voting. One other th caveat that I'll just add is that, you know, I gave you some of the nationally where open primaries is occurring in ranked choice voting. But, you know, we didn't talk about elections are decentralized, a lot of uh, uh, ability for local governments to run it the way they want. The one state that has overwhelmingly the majority of their or has the most ranked choice voting, which would probably surprise people, is the state of Utah. Uh, and Utah did it for a cost effect. It was, it was all about cost efficiency. It was so they didn't have to run a section election. You know, the former county manager, I'm very sensitive to this, is the, the cost of elections. And it was built and passed at the local government level to have a decision made right at the one election and not have a follow-up election. I throw that out there because that's very interesting how things have kind of changed over time. Well, thanks. So we're going to throw it out to any questions that someone might have. Go ahead and raise your hand. And we'd love to, you know, any questions, concerns, confusion that you might have about 133 or 140, we would love to have these two gentlemen answer that for you. Looks like everyone's got it. They're just, they're clear. <laughs> Decks be shared with us that we can read through them in more clarity. Yes, all all this will be all this has been recorded and we'll we'll share the the powerpoints as well. Uh, thank you, Heather. Deborah, you had your hand up. I Go do. Ahead. Thank you. So I love the the explanation. Super clear. Appreciate that. And I do spend a lot of time reading the language and. While sometimes I understand the initiatives, it is very hard to understand what the downstream implications of it are. What what are some good resources for understanding that better? I'd have to, I'd probably defer to Tom on that one. Um, you know, in, in some of my cases, I just think in some of these instances, it's too soon to tell you know, had this been in effect for 50 years, you know, I think we might be able to draw a conclusion. But, you know, I I think in one instance uh, in, in Alaska, they pointed to a, a defeat of a veto um, as their one sort of pivotal point on the effect, how this changed this, this one of these uh, uh, very uh, competitive seats um, and how that race might have turned out different. I, I would say it's, you know, it, even looking at California, I think it's difficult to say, and, and, and I think the problem with California is it's sort of too far uh, majority Democrats instead of sort of an overall competitive um, um, state that would make make a difference. So I'm a little torn on on what that might be, but I, I got a sneaking suspicion the professor might have some some better intel than I do. Mark, because I think you're right. I mean, I think that the it, it... All these have been implemented in such a short period of time. Looking at the the impact and the outcomes have been, you know, the, the, the research is a little mixed, right? So, I mean, part of the issue of top two, um, uh, clearly, and the open primaries that uh, Governor Schwarzenegger picked was the notion of moderating, right, the, you know, not having those extreme candidates. Um, and it, as I said, you know, it, it's, it's, we haven't had it long enough to actually have some long-term implications of what that is. And it's it's been pretty mixed on that. Um, and there's so many different iterations, right? From a simple, simple of just having an open primary to then how it's implemented and throwing in uh, something that at least over the last couple of years, voter ranking, rank choice voting has kind of had a, you know, definitely a partisan uh, uh, negative uh, tone to it, uh, which, uh, yeah. De Deborah, the one thing I would add is that it is definitely a data point from uh, that accentuates the frustration in the electorate with the extremes in both parties. Um, and so we're finally seeing an action point associated with that frustration. Um, and so I expect to see more of these um, in the short term. 
moving forward um, until some, until one of these organizations finally comes up with the secret sauce that is the perfect ballot initiative that works. Um, but I expect to see more of these in this in the future as a frustration on both sides grows. Well, it's somewhat comforting that you as experts don't know the answer, <laughs> but it's also somewhat disconcerting. <laughs> but thank you. Um, uh, just maybe... as a follow up. Oh, oh, go, go ahead, Dave. Dave. I was going to say, just as a follow up to that, um, Marcus and Tom, can you give, is there any history of these things? You know, how many times is, has this proposition or a proposition like this come up? Is it if it fails or if either one of them fails, are they going to, is someone going to come up with them again? Is this, do you, to your point, Marcus, of the, the frustration among the electorate, uh, is this going to go away whether one passes or doesn't? I think at this point, the frust, I think I'm, I'm, if there's a shock that I still have in this business, it is watching uh, elected leadership still shocked at the amount of frustration that's in the electorate. <laughs> and uh, it, it's over a variety of issues, not just a single issue. Um, but what I would, ex you know, if I had to look in my crystal ball and I said that 140 didn't somehow didn't pass this election season, I would expect in four years for them to come back with a um, probably a, a more straightforward version, um, maybe just open primaries and end it there. Um, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. think this ends necessarily with this election season. Um, and if it, and if it does pass, there's certainly opportunities to, to expand on it. It's, um, obviously, as I said, it's more difficult, uh, once you pass something to, to move forward, you can do it through a will of the voters. Um, but as we've seen increasingly, it can, becomes very expensive to get these things, not only on the ballot, uh, but to conduct a campaign against it. I mean, when I look at the amount of money that's being spent this election season, it is absolutely mind blowing to me. And as I tell all my friends at the, in the, in the TV business and the radio business, start lobbying for a Christmas bonus now because your station's making more money than they're ever going to see. Yeah, I agree with Marcus. I think that uh, I think if this doesn't pass, it's something more straightforward, just like open primaries that enjoy a lot of support would probably move uh, forward. But there are two other um, <clears throat> legislative referred initiatives we won't get into, but could make the process even more challenging. Uh, one would allow anyone to have standing to challenge the constitutionality of a proposition before it goes in the ballot. So right now that uh, the courts can, can look at issues of, are there enough procedural issues? Are there enough signatures? And they can opine on that to prevent it from getting on the ballot. But once it gets on the ballot, then they decide whether there's constitutional issues. This change will allow those constitutional issues and anyone to have standing to, to go up front. The reason why that could be a challenge for initiatives is it's very costly, as Marcus said. Now you're gonna put all those upfront costs. And then the second uh, legislatively referred uh, proposition would require the threshold, you know, the thresholds I went to like 15% of the last gubernatorial election for constitutional change. Instead of statewide, it would require that for every county. Uh, so it would make it much more difficult in certain cases to actually get on the ballot. That's a great point. Um, just I'll do one final quick question. Just again, to add some perspective at this point, um, I live in a very red legislative district. So I'm in LD 14, um, and a Republican wins every time. So, um, in my LD, like, can you give me, not specific to mine, but an LD like mine, like how many of our legislative districts are all red or all blue? And if that's the case, can we help people understand if, if that is the case, what percentage of people are actually deciding the election? Because ultimately those elections are decided in the primary. So I just wanna to try to kind of give some context to that as well. And I can start this out and Maybe Tom can chime in. I remember there's 30 districts throughout Arizona. I think a lot of people would tell you that there's eight competitive districts. I will argue to my core that there is not. Um, I may be in the minority. I might, but I think you're closer to five um, than you are certainly to eight. 
Um, and so, um, you know, those five districts become increasingly important when you're looking at passing public policy down at the legislature. And a lot of, there's a lot of pivoting that happened on those five districts. Um, and so when you get into the primaries in the rest of those districts, in those 25 uh, uh, districts, you're probably looking at roughly 20% of the electorate that's making your choice. Um, and it can certainly vary from district to district and election to election, but I sort of use that as a, as a baseline. Um, so for, for instance, you know, in a very Republican district like 14, maybe 20% of your electorates made the decision for the 100% of the, of the district. Um, and, you know, as what I've heard as far as the, the Make Elections Fair Again uh, campaign is that it may have made a difference for Rusty Bowers. Um, if, if any of you, you, you mentioned the East Valley, and so I was sort of focused around that, but Rusty Bowers, certainly the, the former Speaker of the House who went into a very contentious primary um, and lost. Um, and it certainly, it, I, it could have, it certainly could have made a difference uh, in those kind of cases. And I think um, that is sort of the case for the open primaries. Um, it's just where you start to confuse people is when you get into the second part of the rake choice voting. The only thing I'll add to that, I, I think, if I'm not correction, Mark, as you can correct, correct me, is, is about 25% of the elector, you know, uh, and, I mean, I think the argument is in primaries, the more extreme of both parties vote in the primary, they show up, more extreme partisan, let me put it that way. And so, you know, you basically have, you know, what, 25% of the electorate, right, determining who the uh, candidate will be in the general, because the majority, once they get out of the primary, will win because of the voter registration numbers. And Marcus, we did have a question. If you want to put in the chat, what are those districts you feel like are those swing districts? That would be interesting to know. Um, well, oh, okay. Put it in the chat. Uh, we're going to round up here. We are so grateful uh, for your participation today and coming. I know for me, it was incredibly informative to hear um, these perspectives. We are going to continue as a civic engagement team. We're new, but we're mighty, and we are acting fast because we've got an election soon. We are going to be putting together a what's on your ballot party hosting toolkit. Mm -hmm. If that's something interesting to you, we're basically going to have all of the propositions and provide basic resources so that if you wanted to have some people over to your house and say, hey, let's divide this up, everyone present on a different ballot initiative, it will give you a toolkit so that you can do that. We're gonna put the fun back into partisan politics, right? We're gonna try. Um, and speaking of politics, Heather, do you wanna give just um, a quick reminder about the debate tonight? Absolutely. Uh, so Clean Elections, uh, they, uh, they contract to do all of the debates. And so they are hosting an important debate tonight. Uh, it's available on most broadcast uh, stations should be carrying it, but it's at 6 p.m. and it is gonna be between Carrie Lake and Ruben Gallego. So I encourage you guys to watch that debate uh, so that you can make an informed decision. Wonderful. Well, we encourage you to sign up um, using that QR, QR code. That way we can get you that toolkit if you would like that. And then we can keep you informed about what our civic engagement team is doing. If you have interest in joining our impact team, we would love to reach out and have a discussion with you. Uh, again, super grateful for your participation today. Thank you, Professor Riley. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for taking time out of your vacation to, to inform us. And we hope that you feel better prepared to fill out that ballot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.